nice to join this uh, conference. Um, I, I should apologize because the timing that I was given I sort of assumed I'd leave at 1.30 and because of other commitments, I have to stick to that. So I'm going to ask Shekhar to chair it from then onwards because we expect this to be a very spirited session which will go on till 3.30 or something like that. Um, let me just introduce uh, the issue from uh, a kind of GOI policy-making perspective. Um, I mean, it's useful to uh, have that uh, before one. Uh, you know, technically at the moment, uh, there are some things that are, we're doing as cash transfers. So they're usually unconditional. Um, I mean, obviously, scholarships are the most typical cash transfers. There is some rudimentary conditionality that you have to stay registered in a college. There's absolutely no condition that you have to study anything or learn anything or whatever. But you know, if you go to these uh, uh, other areas where uh, in the nature of the thing, uh, there's a choice. That is, I mean, that's the only part that's really interesting, where you either physically deliver uh, some subsidized commodity, uh, or in lieu of that, you give a cash transfer. Uh, that, you know, for obviously, this has been talked about a lot dominantly in the context of food subsidy. Uh, should you continue a system where people get subsidized food or do you just switch to a system of cash transfers? Now, the present position is that, you know, very few people support the idea uh, that you should switch from uh, the PDS to a cash transfer system. And those who actually think that the PDS is very useful, so you might say the stakeholders who believe in the PDS uh, are very strongly opposed to any such shift. So I mean, it's an area where most policymakers tend to be wary of taking a position. Ultimately, I mean, if you're making policy, uh, you want to be quite clear what's the audience that you're addressing. So it's not much use uh, announcing a policy change where most of the people who are actually strongly in favor of the basic policy uh, would actually object very strongly to the change in the instrumentality. I mean, everybody is aware that uh, Mexico and Brazil uh, made the switch from the food subsidy approach to a conditional cash transfer, uh, and general reaction is that's very interesting, and probably something specific about Mexico and Brazil uh, justified. Nobody actually opposes it. Nobody even... Uh, uh, refuses to applaud it. Uh, most people think that's wonderful. I mean, generally, if you ask people, they'll say, would you regard the Mexican and the Brazilian experience as a positive thing? They would say, oh, absolutely. It's one of the well-known successes of development policy. Uh, but from that, it doesn't follow that people are willing to do the same thing here. Now, the issue is actually quite live. And uh, one of the interesting things is that the food security ordinance, which will ultimately become a law, uh, has an enabling provision that would make, would enable a switch if you wanted it. But I'm just saying that at present, uh, there's very little support for it. So one of the things I would look forward to hearing all uh, the three panelists is that uh, in this big divide, uh, where do they stand? Because I just like to tick off, you know, pro, anti. There's some very interesting work that's been done by uh, SEVA, which amongst the civil society organizations has amongst the highest uh, credibility. Uh, Renana Jhabwala, is anyone from SEVA here? No? Downstairs. They are having an exhibition downstairs. Ah, okay. So this is, is this is an upstairs-downstairs <laughs> distinction. <laughs> Um, well, uh, I have a high opinion of SEVA, and almost anyone who works in this area would have a high opinion of SEVA. And Renana had a lot of doubts, and she sort of had the earlier skepticism also about cash transfers. But, you know, uh, being a, a, a person obviously wanting a little bit of uh, experimental work, uh, an evidence-based approach to policy making, she undertook to do cash transfers. Now, there, there were violently opposed to conditionality. So their view is that they, uh, they just don't like conditionality, 
so that part of Brazil and Mexico is deemed to be appropriate for Brazil and Mexico, but not appropriate for India, at least not yet. But they seem to be open to the issue that, you know, maybe if you substitute, instead of giving cheap food, you give an equivalent cash transfer, uh, the thing might work quite well. And then they're finding, actually, in Delhi and subsequently in a survey they did in two villages in Madhya Pradesh, which was actually co-sponsored by, I think, UNICEF or some other very respectable organization, uh, came to the following, I thought, quite important conclusions. Uh, number one, uh, they absolutely and comprehensively established that you can do cash transfer. One of the objections to cash transfers always was that, oh, it'll never be possible, and how can you have bank accounts, and how do you get to the remote areas, and this and that and the other. And I think they absolutely comprehensively established that if you want to do cash transfers, and obviously the, in the transition there'll be problems, you can do cash transfers. The second thing that they established quite comprehensively is that, you know, the myth that when you do cash transfers, the money is in some way misspent is also comprehensively wrong. I may be exaggerating. Uh, I, I, Renana, Renana is not the sort of person who would use words like comprehensively because they obviously seem to assert a very high order of significance statistically. So I'm adding that. But I, I think they did establish that basically the money that was being given was being used on, quote, good things, unquote. So you couldn't really say that the men were spending it on drink and this and that and the other. So I think that's, that's happened only in the last six months. And I think she's made presentations to quite high-level people. Uh, so people are being made aware of that fact. But on the other hand, if you were to uh, uh, pose this uh, to a large number of people who are otherwise quite convinced that the PDS is very essential, I don't think you'll find very much support. Now, you know, I've tried to clarify to people uh, uh, that in the Indian context, you shouldn't view this as a proposal to abolish the PDS and simply give you money. Uh, what we should be doing is to, we retain the PDS, uh, we retain, first of all, we retain the procurement system. So all the farmers who are the backbone of society just don't have to worry about this because half the problem is people say, if you do this, then what happens to procurement? And then the farmers will protest. We keep them out of the picture. Second is that the PDS shops remain in operation, but they sell the product at the economic cost, however you define the economic cost. And the difference between the economic cost at which they sell it and whatever you think is the subsidy is transferred as cash to people who are eligible for the subsidy. I mean, that's the bottom line. So, I mean, in principle, you're getting cash. There's the PDS shop. So those who believe that in a market situation, uh, the shopkeeper will jack up prices and the PDS fellow won't, I mean, all of that uh, is not a concern. They'll be there. Uh, the only thing is, if you've got cash, A, you may not go to the same PDS shop. You could go to other PDS shops. And B, you, you, know, you might want to spend it on something other than grain, and that's the flexibility you would get. I think, I'm not sure whether in the debate this has been understood or not, but I think that's clearly what uh, one should have in mind. So with those introductory notes and being very careful to say that the government's position at the moment is that there is no decision uh, to replace the PDS with cash transfers. Uh, it's factually the case that the uh, food security ordinance contains a provision which would enable you to do it if you wanted to. Now, there's an interesting issue here that what is if you wanted to? It's not clear that if a state government wanted to but the central government didn't, that it could be done. So I think at present what the position is that if both the state government and the central government wanted to, it could be done. So it's a, it's a pretty restrictive setup. Anyway, uh, those are just introductory comments to indicate areas where I'm hoping to pick up knowledge. And with that, uh, let me go straight into learning mode. Uh, I don't know if there's a sequence uh, in which I have to invite. Yes, there is. So Pranam, uh, can uh, I? But just before that, just to say that uh, TN9 and Senses regrets he cannot make it just now. OK. Yeah. OK, thank you, Montek. Um, Given the time, and these are, there are many, many issues here, 
um, I'm going to uh, confine myself to about making about four general points. The first, I'm going to start with the rights approach, which is part of the terms of reference that we have. Um, on rights approach, of course, there are many philosophers who have written given justifications. Uh, most prominent among them had been uh, Ronald Dworkin and Amartya Sen. But I'm taking a more pragmatic point of view on the rights approach. And I see, as in many other issues, I see both um, uh, advantages and disadvantages of, 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 the, uh, of that approach. Advantage is that rights approach, whatever the right, usually is a universal. And it's, I, I like the universalism part of it, as even from a pragmatic point of view, because I think in India, the background of targeted programs uh, is not a particularly happy one. Lots and lots of problems of targeting one. Um, and the second thing I like about the rights approach, that at the minimum, it serves to raise consciousness among the poor and the vulnerable about their entitlements, that they are not mere supplicants to the politicians and bureaucrats, that if those fail, the bureaucrats and politicians fail, there is access to courts to enforce these rights, public interest litigation and court injunctions on these matters, stretching the interpretation of the constitutional right to life, have attracted a great deal of attention. Let me now talk about some of the problems and the limits of the rights approach. And these are obvious. If the delivery structure for implementing some of these rights remain as weak and corrupt as it is now, mere promulgation of rights will remain hollow and will, after a point, generate a great deal of cynicism. Second, as for public litigation, the Indian public arena is already littered with hundreds of unenforced or spasmodically enforced court injunctions. And there is some danger of the proliferating judicial activism in ending up, for all its good intentions, in undermining the credibility and legitimacy of the judiciary itself. Third thing that I wanted to mention on the rights is that if you really want to extend the stretch, the definition of the constitutional right to life that we have, the first thing that uh, comes to my mind is something different from the rights that have now in legislation or going to be part of the legislation. Uh, right to education, for example. What does right to education mean when there is no way of measuring the quality of education, uh, right, uh, edu uh, quality of learning, etc. To my mind, the simplest extension of the right to life would have been right to clean drinking water. That is, the, in a country where millions of, literally millions of children die from waterborne diseases, an extension of right to life would have been right to clean drinking water and public sanitation. But I don't see much discussion uh, in the general public uh, about that. Second, that was about the rights approach. I have other, uh, uh, other views on that, but let me not go farther on that. The second, the thing on which Montek talked about, and there's a big debate on cash uh, versus kind. Uh, uh, I'm going to disappoint Montek, who wanted uh, us to tick off, are you pro or are you con? <laughs> I'm neither. Um, <laughs> uh, I have no rigid position. I'm in favor of experiments. And in fact, I'm a bit disappointed that the food security bill, uh, the dra draft of which uh, uh, I have seen, uh, essentially makes it its PDS. Um, uh, there's, there's a later chapter somewhere that says, uh, enabled uh, cash, etc., but uh, very few people uh, uh, pay attention to it. That's why, for example, people like Jean Dres are very happy with the food security bill because the cash transfer is in a remote uh, chapter. Uh, I think 
we are generally agreed on the huge colossal wastage and corruption uh, that involved in the PDS. Uh, F Food Corporation of Indi India has been a cancerous uh, uh, growth on the economy, not today, for many decades now. Uh, in fact, uh, coming from West Bengal, I can remind some of you that I think about 2007 or 8, uh, when the ration shop dealer uh, said, "No, there's no no more no supply no more supplies this this year this time this week," uh, villagers started burning the food shops, and then it spread like wildfire. Many villages, uh, the poor people and other people, started burning the food shops. That tells you something. Uh, having said that, let me say also that there have been large improvements, significant improvements, in some states in the food distribution. And the most remarkable, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, etc., uh, has always been the case, uh, but the most, uh, most substantial improvement, dramatic improvement, is in a quote-unquote backward state, which is Chhattisgarh. Uh, Kerala, Himachal Pradesh, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, uh, have been reasonably good for quite some time, but Chhattisgarh, in, in a, from a very poor uh, food distribution, uh, PDS food distribution, now it's one of the better uh, ones. Uh, and I'm told, I have to study it much more carefully, the Chhattisgarh case, which, which really interests, interests me, uh, that one reason, one among many reasons, of this dramatic improvement is that the responsibility of the food distribution uh, has been taken over by the panchayats and the self-help groups. Uh, and I'd like to study that, uh, the process through which it's been done. But in general, I agree with the position of the cash transfer people who say, uh, those pro-cash transfer people who say, given the relatively low price elasticity of food, uh, of food grain demand, uh, this will mean the PDS, what it does, it gives, uh, uh, it does not increase the consumption of the grains. People just use that money for something else. So in a sense, it's an implicit income transfer. And if so, why not in cash? That is the, uh, that is the argument. And I think that there's a lot of sense in that argument, subject, of course, to some constraints one, I think most people will agree that in very, I think Montek also hinted at that, um, uh, in most people will agree that in very remote areas of India, the markets will not, even if people are, have cash to spend, markets will not be spontaneous. And even when it's spontaneous, they will not be competitive. So there will be some monopoly, a uh, lot of monopoly power uh, exercised there. And there may be some scope for retaining, as Montek suggested, the PDS uh, shops uh, there. Similarly, the, some of the most vulnerable groups may not be, we are not yet ready to leave them to the mercy of the market. And, and some of the, one of the most important vulnerable groups is preschool children. Preschool children uh, are in a, you know, is what in India goes on is a disaster. And I think this disaster has to be handled in a, almost a war footing. And, and there, uh, yes, the market mechanism should be used, but any other mechanism uh, that can be uh, used for addressing the food deficit uh, for the preschool children, and maybe one should also extend it to widows, disabled people, etc merely leaving them, just giving them cash and leaving them to the market forces may not be enough. And then thirdly, uh, one is the remote area, second is this vulnerable group, and thirdly, the issue is one of, um, issue of autonomy of the, for the poor versus paternalism, which I think is a very important issue. In general, I'm in favor of autonomy for the poor, uh, yes, some of them, some of the money may be, uh, if you give it in cash, some of the money will be spent in booze, etc. But let the poor make their own mistakes. Uh, and as Montek 
suggested that maybe they, then it's not uh, people are exaggerating the problem. But for certain problems and certain groups, I am for paternalism and preschool children and, uh, and some other groups, I'm still in favor of paternalism. And similarly, uh, this is also a use of uh, issue of giving them information. This pro exam problems, for example, comes up in the case of uh, vaccination. Just leaving them for people to just do it by themselves may not work. So nutrition packets, vaccination program uh, for preschool children, particularly these may be paternalism, calls for paternalism. Similarly, given the situation of health, awan health awareness and consciousness in India, preventive, some preventive public health programs like vector control, purification of drinking water, environmental sanitation, these involve life and death issues and do not feature in our electoral agenda uh, and those therefore uh, still call for quite a bit of paternalism. Otherwise, I am in general in favor of autonomy for the poor. So that's why my position is somewhat mixed. I want to keep it flexible, open for experiments. If Nitish Kumar, Sheila Dixit wants to do cash, let them and see uh, what are the experience, what, what does the experience tells us. So that's my third set of points. Sorry, second set of points on first was the rights, second is on cash versus kind. The third issue, and this is, I find, uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, discussion yeah, sure. about high costs of the anti-poverty programs. Now, I'm in favor of, very much in favor of um, minimizing as much as possible leakage and corruption in these programs. And that's why I was arguing against FCI, for example. But the cost is still estimates should be kept in some perspective. Now, and here I refer to something that I've always been telling for the last few years, Govinda Rao, to redo the exercise he and Sudipta Mandal did of estimating the implicit and explicit subsidies in India. Uh, but the latest that they had uh, toward the end of the 90s, on the basis of middle 90s data, let me quote that. So taking implicit and explicit subsidies, central and state together, uh, come to about, uh, in their early estimate, is about 14% of GDP in subsidies. Uh, if you ask me, my guess is it's probably gone up, because since then, fertilizer subsidy, fuel subsidy, etc., gone up enormously. But let's take the 14% figure. In their estimate, of the 14%, 9% of GDP was going to what they call non-merit subsidies, largely going to the better off people. So 9% of GDP go to better off sections of the people. Whereas all the anti-poverty programs will come to less than 3%. So I think that should give us some perspective People usually talk about, should we get the poor dependent on doles? Well, the rich in India are dependent on doles, so I don't see an extra harm in giving the poor some doles. And the rich doles, if that 9% is a, is, is, is a right figure, then it's several times the total amount of dole that we give to poor people. I've actually extended this, and I've suggested uh, a basic proposal for basic income, uh, if the rich, those rich, are, are prepared to give up only one third of those subsidies to the rich, uh, that can allow you to give to every family in India, uh, around the current price is about 11,000 rupees every year. Uh, and, and, and that's to each family, rich or poor. Last point and that I'm going to make is one thing that is not usually discussed in the context of social uh, protection. We, we, are in a, we are a country where probably one of, has the largest uh, informal sector in the world. 
it does have implication for social pr protection. And that is, in India, you cannot distinguish, really, between social protection and livelihood protection. Because you cannot really distinguish in India for a large pers uh, fraction of the population between the household and the enterprise. So in that case, social protection blurs into livelihood protection. And livelihood protection, therefore, includes ways in which the household can be a viable enterprise as well. So we, sh we should think about, uh, we should extend the definition of social protection in India to include some of the measures which will make some of these enterprises somewhat more viable. This, of course, includes credit, information, marketing, etc. Let me not go into that. My time is up. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pranab. Now let me uh, request, take a bow. Uh, Thank you. Um, I, I will start with um, the study that uh, Montek referred to for two reasons. Um, one is because he referred to it, and two is that um, this study is especially in, um, of relevance to what I'm going to say in many ways, right? Now, um, this study was uh, actually designed and done by us. And when we did this study, one of the things that we wanted to uh, do by us, I mean IDF, well, what we wanted to do is to you know, look at the basic problem, the criticism that is made against cash transfer, especially when it comes to food, is that, or when it comes in lieu of food, is that um, it will be used for consuming bads. Right? So, so that is the standard argument that is given. And given what uh, Pranav just said, right, I strongly believe that that's extremely, extremely paternalistic and a bit unfair, right, to say that the poor are poor because they drink up the money that they get. I find that completely unacceptable as a starting point. But the best way to do it is to carry out the study and actually see if that is indeed happening and keeping in mind all the problems which are real in cash transfer, especially in your food, like, you know, whether there are alternative uh, sources of supply of food whether uh, the household uh, dynamics and the household uh, power structure and all allow the children to be given proper food, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We obviously wanted to locate the experiment in a place or in a, in a region where there were alternative sources, there were a lot of schools available, there was a lot more awareness than uh, in a remote uh, caste-ridden village or what have you, right? So, so, we, so that was the purpose of the study, to see whether people who want the cash transfer in lieu of PDS, were wanting it because they wanted to consume bad, or were they wanting it because it was better for them to have the cash, right? So that is, you know, which is precisely the criticism that is leveled against cash transfer. Now, um, for that reason, we did not want to focus on many of the things. We were not interested in what were they going to spend the money on. We were just focused on was nutrition to children being guaranteed and were they consuming bad, right? So that, that was the focus, that is how we uh, constructed the study. And there, you know, whatever uh, Montek said was found in the study is true, right? That is what we found, though I would agree that we did not use the term comprehensively, right? The, there, were <laughs> there were two, it's an oversight for sure because nobody mentions idea when referring to the study. <laughs> There are two other things we found, which um, also we did not, did not want to tom tom about because, as I said, they were not the focus of the study, but we found those results as a bonus. One was that the indebtedness of many of these households came down. So they obviously opted for the cash transfer because they had payments to make. Right? But the nutrition didn't go down, so that was okay. And the other thing we found is that the quality of service in the ration shops went up over the year. Now, we don't know if it was because of this, because the experiment was not designed to find that out. That's why we do not make a big deal about it. But that is what we found right, in this study. Seva is also doing another study in MP, which you also mentioned. That study, which is a universal cash transfer, that was also designed by us. And in fact, it was, we had a very good experience there because all the UID for those 20 villages that Seva is working in were done by IDF, right? So we had a great experience in seeing how the UID works. 
And there, indeed, the study was designed to see whether unconditional cash transfers work or not. Right? Now, there is another cash transfer study that IDF has done. It is a, it is a pilot that was carried out in Odisha, in one district of Odisha, where we gave money to SCST girls who had dropped out in class eight to get them back to school. Right? We did it purely as a pilot. This was not a research design. It was just to ensure that the children, especially the girl children, went back to school. Now, given the success of that pilot, we are now doing it in uh, all the 29 districts of uh, Odisha, right? And now we are going to do the research design because we have a lot more districts to work with. So, you know, if you ask me clearly, if we design cash transfers correctly, then it does work or it may work. I'm sure there are better alternatives too, but this looks to be a better alternative than what we have currently, regardless of whether it comes to food in Delhi or uh, education in Odisha, but we need to do a lot more in this. So that is my the, you know, take on cash transfers. I do agree that there are a lot of issues to look at. I think the problem is that in India we always take extreme positions, and uh, I understand what Pranab meant when he said that uh, I'm neither here nor there. The basic thing is that there is no point being uh, rigid or taking an ideological stand on this. Clearly, if we look at cash transfers, in certain cases they would work, and one of the cases that I would think it will work is where the government is involved in delivering marketable services. Right? There, obviously, we should base ourselves on the market, right? And, you know, when there is a remote village where alternatives are not available, then it's clearly not, a, you know, there is an issue of market failure. So it's not surprising that we would not expect cash transfer to work there. But if we take that view, then many of the cobwebs in the debate around cash transfer would probably go away and we'll be able to take more uh, informed uh, decisions on what's, where the cash transfer would work. For example, I seriously think that um, the attempt that is being made to uh, give the kerosene subsidy, that everybody refers to the experiment which failed, but if anybody, if anybody looks at where it was done and how it was done, right, I'm sure they would have been shocked had it worked. Right? It was so ill-conceived unfortunately Tom Tom does the experiment on how the kerosene subsidy works, that the fact that it failed, right, was used to say that cash transfers don't work, you see. But if you look at how it was implemented, right, not even the most ardent proponents of cash transfer would say that it will succeed, right? So, so you know, so, so we have to be a bit more careful in understanding what we are saying when we uh, want to do a cash transfer. And I think that is what Pranam was referring to when he talked about experimentation, because it needs to be seen what, in what way the cash transfer will work. Okay, now um, connecting it to uh, the rights approach. You know, I, again, I feel that when we talk of the rights approach, we're talking of rights of citizens. We're not talking of rights of BPL or rights of APL. When we talk of a safety net, we are not talking about the safety net for those who will fall through the safety net, right? Or who have, sorry, who have fallen through the safety net. When we talk about safety net, we are talking about safety net for all. And I don't think, unfortunately, that we can relate our targeted cash transfer policies to the rights approach unless, as Pranav pointed out, we appreciate the fact that the rights are meant for everybody. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you can pay or not. I'll give a trivial example to make my point. That if today we were to say that when there is an attack on our borders, those who can pay for the military should pay, uh, while the other poorer citizens will be you know, looked after because we have a right to security from external threat, right? Now, it, it, I, I, if we say the, the same things about the police, right? In India it is happening, right? There are private persons have their own security guards if they can pay for it. That's not the efficient system. Why should it be the efficient system when it comes to right to food? Why should it be the efficient system when it comes to right to health, right? So unless we are talking about universal rights, I don't think we should try and equate the targeted cash transfer policy that we talk about all the time with the rights approach, and I completely agree with Pranab on this. The second thing that I want to mention on this is, um, you know, one thing that is, I, I heard it in the morning, I heard it through the discussion, I hear it every day, that there are political compulsions to taking decisions, right? When we are talking about the rights approach, we are trying to conceive of a society which we do not have now, right, in India. We, we are trying to do that. We are trying to talk about a better society. Now, if we look at history, 
all major you know, improvements in a societal setup has been taken not by looking at whether the people are supporting it or not. People who have gone ahead and taken the wrong decision in a democracy have been defeated in the next election. But people who have taken the right decision have been brought back. So if our leaders are always looking for political you know, uh, backing for every decision that they take, then no good decision would be taken. Right? This we have to understand. This has been borne out by history all the time, including in our own history. Right? If we look at you know, our own history of major decisions that were taken, which had positive long-lasting impact, they were not taken right, with the support of the people. The people supported after the decisions were taken. So we have to think afresh on whether we want a rights approach, whether we want a cash transfer approach, of, which is a targeted type. Right? There are a lot of benefits to it, but does it you know, get us the whole way? I think these are issues we should be discussing. And in general, my position is that cash transfer on certain specific, this is to answer Montek's last point, that on certain specific issues, I think cash transfers are the way to go. Now, those issues do involve as I said, the type of uh, the purpose of the cash transfer, as well as the region, the geography, where we are trying to implement it. Thanks very much, uh, Subhashish. And now, can I request Abhijit? Fifteen minutes. Thank you, um, thank you, Montek. Um, so, uh, I guess much of um, I mean, maybe the reason why Mr. Nainan didn't show up is that he, th he thought he'll be on a panel with three Bengalis who'll say the same thing, uh, and. <laughs> Uh, and uh, unfortunately, that's about to happen. Uh, uh, so I, I mostly agree with my fellow Bengalis and colleagues, um, except I, I guess I'm maybe, let me start by um, tr tr trying to go back a bit to the way the the panel topic was phrased. So let me try to go back to the question of, you know, where are we relative to the question of a modern welfare system? Uh, I think that's a, that's a good way of framing it, except that I don't know what a modern welfare system is. So there's a, there is a, I'm constrained by that. So I'm going to make something up, uh, call it the modern welfare system, and then proceed. Uh, so I'm going to, what, I think my sense of what maybe one could describe as a modern welfare system is a system that combines two elements. One is a kind of an unconditional guarantee. So, some things are, every, no human being should be without them. And then beyond that focuses very specifically on need. That, so insurance is a very good example of what a modern welfare system aspires to do, uh, which is if, in situations of need, you will have something. Or likewise for uh, for he healthcare, um, you could you would imagine that you know a, a modern welfare system would have the you know have access to say, you know when in when you really need healthcare and you whether or not you can pay for it you should have healthcare. So there's a sense in which it combines a sense of of universal entitlement with a sense of a, a, a strong uh, emphasis on need and the related notions of efficiency. So we want to make sure that the, that the, the benefits go to the people who need them. Now, in, if from that perspective, I would say that we're, our current welfare system, and I'm going to bring in some things that we haven't talked about, is kind of only beginning to nibble around the edges of this idea, at best. So um, in some ways, the worst possible, let me start with the worst possible example, and that's healthcare. So nobody talks about right to healthcare. I wish people would, because then I think we could say we have one. We have universal healthcare. Everybody has healthcare. Uh, we have, by the definition, so in other words, in the way the right to education is specified, it's the, the right to education is specified as a set of inputs that everybody must have. There is no discussion of, the Right to Education Act does not have 
the word um, learning in it. Uh, so if we get, take, take the same interpretation of right to health, so that no health outcomes are covered by it, then we indeed have a right to health. We have within you know, X kilometers a subcenter, within Y kilometers a center that varies by the terrain and the population density. We have a whole set of principles, I think, formulated in the Planning Commission in 1972 during the sixth plan, which lays out in great detail our aspiration for it, and we have delivered on that aspiration. Everybody has a health care set. Now, Nobody goes to those healthcare centers. Uh, there is a nationwide survey which finds, the, which Kartik was I think, part of, which finds that 20% of all visits are to those healthcare centers. 80% of all visits are not to the government healthcare centers. This includes the bottom any percent of the population. So take any, any percentile you want, and they don't go to the government healthcare system. So everybody, the right to healthcare, as described, in parallel with the right to education, it already exists. We should announce that we have, <laughs> have a right to education, a right to healthcare, um, be done with it, um, except that nobody wants it. And I, I think that there is a, cl so in that sense, we, we are, what I think is missing there is exactly this, that sense that, uh, you know, that the first order concern of a, Welfare system has to be that whether it's delivering what people need. And I think that concern is, so I think we start from a premise which in all of this, which is informed by experts who know what inputs everybody should have. And then from that, we declare it a right, and then we're done. We, 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 I think, what? why am I saying that? The reason I'm saying that is, let's come to the right to, right to food. Let's think of what problem it was supposed to serve. So the problem it's supposed to solve is the problem of malnutrition. It's been, at least that's how it was, it's been framed by its supporters. Now, I, I, I'm not in favor of the right to food. I'll say that uh, 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 bluntly. And the reason is that I think this is not going to solve the problem of malnutrition. That I can guarantee. The reason why it won't solve it is because it isn't designed to do it. It's completely not designed to do it. It, it is, it's, I think Pranab already laid out the economics of it. The economics of it is that, think of a family that buys 40 kilos of grain a month. You would give, giving them 20 kilos of grain at a subsidized price the marginal price of a kilo of rice has not changed for that family. You're still buying at the market price. Whatever you do, and what matters for the decision to buy an extra kilo is the marginal price. So there's no price effect. If there's an any effect, it has to be an income effect. And the income effect is, go we know two things. One, we know that once it's an income effect, there's no reason to necessarily take the mechanism of food to deliver it. And second, we know that if it is if it's a if it's an income effect, it's small. We the elasticity of of calories with respect to income is a maximum of 0.3, and the highest number I've ever seen is 0.3, and the lowest number I've seen is zero. Uh, there is actually an, uh, a, a randomized control trial in in China which finds negative. Um, so. But I, let's say that I leave that out. Most of the standard wisdom is, is it's very close to zero. So basically, we know that there is not going to be a huge effect on nutrition. Now, why? Why the, Well, you could still say, well, if this is a way of transferring resources to the poor, and I'm absolutely in favor. I think we, as a country, we 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 have much too much inequality, and we don't transfer enough to the poor. Now, having said that, is 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 this? There, is there a re reason to, why, why am I therefore against this? I'm against it because we could have actually taken this opportunity to have a right to nutrition. We could have actually focused on the question. And uh, there are many things we, we, we could have done which we will not do because we've solved the problem. Now we have given, we solve nutrition. Uh, whereas we could have actually focused on the problem of nutrition and then we would have perhaps uh, done something about it. Now, if you, it's a mother Chavan who uh, many of you know, uh, often says that the reason why 
you see this recent decline in test scores in Asar, three years of substantial uh, test score decline, is because in 2009, the right to education was passed. After that, we've done it, and immediately test scores start declining. And uh, year after year after year, they decline. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm anticipating something like that. Uh, so in, so I, I think that, I think what's fundamentally, let me now step back a little bit more. I think what's fundamentally, what was I think, well, interesting about the the food and now coming to the cash and cash versus food debate is that almost none of this there was a lot of deliberation actually interestingly but almost none of this the basic economics of this was ever in that discussion it was kind of an interest striking fact that you had a lots of deliberation of all the evil things that money could do but this basic economics was very well understood. We understood it. We've, there, there's been 30 years of research or 40 years of research on the income elasticity of demand for food in India, uh, for nutrients in India. You know, um, this we pioneered this in a sense in this country, and we we know that the income elasticity is very low. Why? Why did we? Why wasn't that number thrown around as a big part of the conversation? I, this is what bizarre about this whole, whole, whole deliberation we had on on this subject because you know there was a, a very clear set of facts that were out there. This is not going to be marginal. It's going to be an income effect. The income effects are small. So we, what what is it going to do? We never had that discussion, and it, it seems to me that what what I find disappointing about I think. Uh, again about the discussion on food versus cash is that you know it, it it's essentially framed as you know uh, somehow that the the contrast is between you know i'm going to take some hot food out of the mouth of a child and shove in a rupee note whereas in some sense the in what we are doing is in effect changing the parents' budget constraint by exactly the same amount. And that recognition of that, I mean, obvious fact is nowhere in this debate. Now, that not to say that there aren't reasons why you may, you may favor, favor food. And I think the biggest reason, sadly, is the credibility of the government. I think the one, one place where I actually am sympathetic to the people who argue for, against cash is is the is because this I think they implicitly they are making the claim that the whatever inflation adjustment the government says it'll make it won't make it I think that's the fundamental I think uh, credibility problem that makes I think cash vulnerable if the government were actually credible in saying what it said that we will manage to somehow you know, take account of local inflation rates in the appropriate way and and make the transfers. I think I think and people actually believed it. Actually, don't think I, I don't agree with Montag when he says there's no support for it. I mean, I, I think that if you if you actually so I think there is a survey which says there is no support for it. I think people uh, I think the survey uh, there's a Drez and um, Kara survey. I, I am not persuaded. I think the way you ask that question will have huge effects. If I say, do you want hot food or do you want some cash that may or may not arrive? I'll give one answer and, and I could ask the question differently as well. Um, so I, I, I am not, I, I, I do feel that uh, there is, so I think that, um, so let me say one last thing and then conclude. I was going to conclude today. There is a, a, a bigger and I think very comprehensive cash experiment, not in India, but in Kenya. It has just been completed. That experiment finds very, very large effects of cash on, you know, the ob of cash transfers on many things, on, on, on um, not, not as you might imagine on nutrition, because it's been kind of, but on, Specifically on three things. Most striking is domestic violence. So domestic violence goes down, and it doesn't matter who you give the money. Prime of I see evidence against. Let me conclude. 
Um, so I guess my main point is that I think if we had to, if I had to think of sort of a, a, a modern um, welfare system, I think the first thing that a modern welfare system, where I think we are nowhere near a modern welfare system, is that we haven't yet developed a culture of using considerations of efficiency and trade-off in any public discourse. Not just in this case, but in any case. We don't, so I think, um, um, I think the, the core idea of a modern welfare system is that, which is that, you know, we will, we will transfer a certain amount, uh, but then let's do it in the way that's best for people. Indonesia just did something which, for example, we, um, so let me say what it is. Indonesia just raised fuel prices by 60% and matched it with a, a scaled targeted transfer where the poorest people will get the biggest transfer. Uh, and one of the things they did after they did that is they organized public discourse on this. And they, they have I think by now created a culture within which at least the discussion of these issues is feasible. You know, you can have public dis discussion. We, I think our fundamental failure at this point is that we have no public conversations about trade-offs. We don't say that, you know, everybody wants a right, uh, you know, uh, uh, and rights are framed as being unconditional. They're not to be relativized to anything else. And I think that's fundamentally the core flaw of our welfare thinking, that we, we, we don't have conversation. We say that, you know, well, we could have this, 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 and this, but we can't have all of, the, all of all, this, 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 or this, but we can't have all, have all of them. Let's figure out which one is better. Let's think of what we are trying to hit. How can that, that conversation never happens. Until we get to that conversation, there's no sense in which we're going to have a modern welfare system. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Abhijit. Thank you. Lots of quite thoughtful and thought-provoking comments, particularly Abhijit's last comment that, you know, we just don't have a discussion. I, I think it's, uh, there's a lot in what he says. Of course, in the, in the food issue, the reason, I think, is that the discussion took place in court. And actually, uh, if all the people who felt this was the wrong way to go could have impleded themselves, and the only way they could have been heard is if they had done that. Otherwise, what happened was this whole thing was debated in court, and then it led to whatever political discussion. Mind you, uh, I mean, I, I can't help feeling that one thing you need to reflect about, on the one hand, Abhijit says that we just don't discuss these things. On the other hand, uh, Amartya describes us with a certain amount of pride as argumentative Indians. So what's going on? I mean, either we should ask him to recall that book, uh, put, <laughs> or we're just not arguing. Uh, anyway, um, thanks a lot, and uh, the floor is open. Yep. Yes, after that, TN. Um, with a panel of such eminent economists, I was really surprised to hear uh, no, none of the until Abhijit started to talk, none of the usual things we say as economists. And maybe it would be good to replace the language of rights with the language of economics 101. So I would <laughs> say that. Um, we, um, uh, getting a good modern welfare system you, really means getting a good modern government system that then turns its attention to uh, helping the poor in particular. I was very surprised, and a uh, good government system are the things that handle public goods, <laughs> big externalities, things that have to be handled uh, in collect in, as a collective in, in, and not as an uh, individual thing. And then we worry about transfers. I was very surprised, Pranav, <laughs> when you described um, sanitation and clean water as paternalistic, I would have thought that those are the pure, pure, get best examples of real public good, uh, pest control and, and, and sanitation. And it's not paternalistic, it's fixing things that need uh, fixing by collective action. And so a good welfare state would be first fixing the <laughs> first fixing the big ex, uh, the big market failures which you have to do because individuals can't do that themselves, 
And then we worry about uh, the most efficient way of making sure that the poor uh, benefit as well. The remoteness is another one, which is, so build them a road. I mean, that's the thing that, uh, that they can't do, uh, do themselves. I'm not sure that that kind of poverty is a market failure. It was the lack of infrastructure. In any case, the, uh, the first things first. First, solve the collective action problems, and then worry about the transfer. Clean water is a better pretend. All I said, in fact, the next sentence, my mind was that these are so crucial, and yet they are not on the electoral agenda. So, uh, if people are not demanding them out there, demanding in the beginning, you may have to be paternalistically give to them. That's all I meant. I didn't mean anything else. Actually, I actually lay down the rules now, and that is that panelists will only be given a chance at the end. Okay. Uh, so because otherwise, <laughs> any good question will provoke a good response. And so okay. I think uh, we have a lot of comments, and then the panelists come in uh, okay. in the last bit. Tien. You want to press the button? On the rights approach, uh, Pranab mentioned Dworkin and Amartya, uh, Amartya's work on the rights approach. Amartya, in the context of human rights, lay, lays out three conditions under which a, a, the rights approach could be rationalized. And one of them is in the society in which this is going to be, something is going to be pronounced as a right, there is universal agreement on what that would be. Now, I, it's un, from the uh, discussion I, I heard from the panel, it looks as if there is no universal agreement that certain kilograms of uh, grains has to be uh, <laughs> given as a right to every citizen in, the, in India. So it fails on that ground. Now, ground number one. Ground number two is it is not, it's proclaiming something as a right without having an agency who is responsible for delivering it and being held accountable for uh, not delivering if, uh, if they do not. That, with the current government or any other, any government that we have had in India, it would not qualify as an agency which which would satisfy those two questions. I won't go to the third condition. <laughs> and so I would dismiss this whole idea of making you know, right to food or right to education or right to all that until the first two conditions are satisfied. So, so, so much for the right, right, to, uh, right to food approach. Now, sec on cash versus kind transfer, Pranab laid down the condition, you see, the, Panelists seem to be like Trishanku. Uh, uh, you want to lay between earth and heaven, somewhere hanging between, and not making any... Uh, sure. uh, Deliberate. Uh, yes. And I would rather that they're backing up their mind. Now, in the, in the conditionalities under which you would prefer a, 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 a having a physical transfer, it seems to me the market failure the type of argument, remoteness, etc. already Jeff has responded to it. So I won't, I won't go into it. But one uh, feature that I will emphasize is imagine the food is a tradable, uh, uh, grains are a tradable, internationally tradable, uh, domestically tradable commodity. So only re relevant consideration is globally the system as it happened in 1973-74 or other play, uh, times, the, uh, because of c concatenation of circumstances, the global food commodity prices, in particular food prices, go up. Now, unless you have physical uh, uh, the grain available, the subsidy that you, uh, the physical grain available, you may not be able to uh, meet the uh, guaranteed whatever kilograms that you are guaranteed. The, because of supply constraint, except in those to meet that. For to meet that, you might have a buffer stock or whatever operation in the domestic economy, and that shouldn't be confused with the, with the, uh, with the cash transfer or kind transfer issue. So as my qualification, if at all there is to be a qualification to cash transfer, it should be that, uh, uh, that the 
under circumstances where the uh, supply constraints would make it infeasible to de deliver the guarantee uh, if you didn't have physical stocks of grain at home. That is the only qualification I would make. Otherwise, it makes no sense to make an income transfer through kind rather than give the cash transfer and let the poor or non-poor or whoever also have the freedom. And the last point. Now, nutrition. I think this nutrition business, we should keep it out. Now, there is no meaningful, the simply focusing on calorie uh, doesn't uh, address the issue of nutrition. And so this notion that we are, we are making the food transfer for nutrition is an absurdity. Forget that. And the second uh, thing is attempting to correct the intra-household allocation failures, whether the children are neglected or women are neglected in the allocation of things. And this food transfer program is going to have some impact on that or affect that. That again is a meaningless, meaningless uh, uh, policy intervention. So. All the qualifications uh, fall, or fall to the ground if you push them. And so I would, I would, I won't be a Trishanku. I would say I am in favor of cash transfer alone, nothing else. Thank you very, thank you very much, Dean. I'm now going to ask uh, Devesh and then Surjit. And, and then I'm going to request Shrekhar to come and chair the meeting. Devesh. Uh, Montek, you said uh, at the beginning that the people are opposed to cash transfers. You use that expression. Is it the people in Nellore, Nagpur, or in the NAC? <laughs> Who are these people? <laughs> I think. <laughs> Let me finish. Okay. What I said was, Mike, what I said was there's no support. I didn't say that the. NSS, in its extensive questionnaires, had put in one such questionnaire. Uh, what I, well, I, I think what I really meant, maybe, is that, right, that for a commodity, I mean, if you assume that the commodity has zero price elasticity, I mean, you're only giving them an income transfer, and then the issue is exactly what's the most efficient way of giving an income transfer. This just wasn't raised. I mean, if you go through the entire the EPW, the economists, well, one or two, yes, but I'm, uh, I mean, given the huge number of people, this very specific point did not surface. I mean, now, I'm sure some of the people who opposed it were here, are here, and they'll raise their, but that, that was what I meant. I did not mean uh, that, you know, uh, there were any kind of polling done. But it is true, one assumes that, you know, if you've got so many economists around, then they would also lobby MPs. The vast majority of uh, the political side never were told that, look here, this is a better way of achieving the same objective. The political side were always told this is a fiscal disaster, with which, by the way, I agree. I mean, for all the reasons, I mean, you know, the, the petroleum subsidy is huge. And so any fiscal case should not be resting on what you're doing on the food front. Uh, I'm sorry to have interrupted. None of this is out of your time. But since people made a reference, I think I should clarify. Go ahead, Devesh. So just a small point on the Supreme Court. Uh, after all, the government has an attorney general that is supposed to represent the government's stance. The attorney general was played a very modest role, shall we say, because the attorney general has been preoccupied in rescuing members of the cabinet from their extracurricular activities, so it doesn't have time for these minor things. The second is that the Supreme Court did not specify that you must give X kg of Y grain at Z price. That has come from this government. So while I do agree with your point on the Supreme Court, the responsibility for this purely lies with the government. Yeah, first point just on your latest one. I think it's a bit unfair uh, to blame the people at large when the government only reads the EPW to say that there was no opposition. <laughs> I think that's just, they're just as, as you would say, they're just plain wrong. Um, I have three points on, on the rights and experiments. Um, the first one that the employment guarantee scheme was offered as a right. 
And I just would like to know just a pure empirical question. Um, either it is the case that all the poor people have got the 100 days of employment, or we must have our court already full as they are with new cases of the poor people who haven't got. So how many times has this right of employment been exercised because of the employment guarantee scheme? A pure empirical question. There's no theory behind it. There's nothing. I just want to know how many times, which is related to my second point. And, you know, this reminds me of Bob Dylan's song, you know, how many roads must a man travel? How many experiments must Pernab see before he is able to make up his mind? <laughs> the PDS system has been in operation, and that goes for your earlier comment too, Montague has been in operation since 1976. The employment guarantee programs has been in, in, in phases since 1973 when it was first started. It didn't come under a Rajiv Gandhi employment scheme or something else, but there were employment schemes in the country since 1973 and since 1980, national employment guarantee schemes, if you will, of exactly the same amount. So how many times must we have an experiment? So either you tell me that, listen, we did this, it's worked so well, and there let me remind you, all of you, including you, Pranam, that um, Jean Dres wrote an article in the Times of India, and all of you can Google it and look at it. As we all know, he's a major supporter of the rights schemes, of the rights approach, the wrong rights approach, but never mind, where the article says, the employment guarantee schemes in India, the article is called the Loot for Work Program. So what is his answer to the Loot for Work Program? Let's expand it. So what is the government's answer to the Loot from PDS Program? Let's expand it. So therefore, this entire thing, and I, I'm very shocked that you are saying that the government wants to keep the PDS system. Well. I can quite see a politician saying they want to keep the PDS system because that's how corruption goes. If you, all of you guys are wondering why is it that there's a lot amount of food, if you will, destruction um, in the economy where it rots. Well, it doesn't really rot. It is sold to the liquor trade. So the point is the government and its officials are very calmly saying, listen, you know, we gather the food because we have to help the farmers. And we gather the food, but it rots because we don't have go-downs. <laughs> well, there is a deliberate rotting going on. No, no, it is important to raise these issues. It is very important because the country has been taken for an enormous ride. And the last point on the results of cash transfers. Now, Subhashish offered one example, I like to see that study, purely an empirical question. How many studies in the world have there been on cash transfers, and how many times have they shown that it hasn't worked? Just, I would like to have, ignore my polemics, ignore my upsetness, just answer. So he, that's a good question, and he'll answer yeah. it. Uh, by the way, I want to just clarify, again, chairman's privilege. When I said continue the PDS system, I said continue it, but they'll be pricing the grain at the cost, at the economic cost. All the incentive to leak would then disappear. The transfer would take place as a subsidy. A uh, separate issue. What I mean is if people don't want to go buy any grain from the shop, it'll disappear automatically. So that was my point. However, I didn't notice that Arvind was there, and although I didn't mention him, uh, particularly I'm sure since you've just been interviewed and I heard, saw your comments on Chhattisgarh, I think I should ask Arvind Panagriya to ask a question. And then uh, Shekhar can take over the chair. Say it, you know, uh, first of all, you said, Montek, something about that the stakeholders really don't want cash, they want the PDS. Not sure which. Who? Did, did you say this or not? Maybe I misunderstood. No, no, no. Uh, the, uh, in, in, in the initial comments when you made. Yeah, no, no. Uh, the evidence that was collected from those surveys invariably ended up in favor of cash. Okay. But you, you did not say that the stakeholders don't want PDS replaced you know, by uh, cash. In the, Delhi, in the Delhi survey that Renana no, did, no, I, know, I, know, I mean, yeah. uh, there was a lot of lobbying against it, and she claimed 
that many of the people lobbying were sort of uh, arm twisting the so-called stakeholders. But in the end, the stakeholder was quite happy with cash. Mind you, yeah. she did say the stakeholders wanted more cash. That's, of course, quite logical. Yeah. But, you know. <laughs> okay. So, and there is at least two points or three. Uh, very quickly. Uh, this, this whole thing about rights, you know, uh, this was a big issue in the constitution, constitutional debates. Uh, what were the rights and what were the principles of direct, uh, directive principles of policy? Uh, Ambedkar, in fact, wanted to put the things like uh, elementary right to education, right to food in the fundamental rights. But K.M. Munshi came along and explained to him why that was a st stupid thing to do. He didn't use the word stupid, sorry. But uh, th th his point was that, look, you know, when you talk of fundamental rights like right to speech, these are negative rights. The government violates them. Supreme Court comes and says, sorry, you can't violate it. When it comes to providing food, providing education, these are positive rights. The Supreme Court cannot enforce. It cannot tell it that you do it. It's an enforcement mechanism in this case fails entirely. So it was, there was a good reason why these things got put into the di principles of directive, uh, directive principles of policy. Also, I think it was an argument that, look, you know, that, uh, uh, these things vary by the socioeconomic circumstances that as societies will get richer, there will be larger entitlements, perhaps, and when they're poor, they won't be. So, you know, it, 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 whereas the right to speech is something very fundamental. Whether you're poor or rich, it doesn't depend on it. So this whole idea, I think, is, 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 is very worrying, actually, putting in uh, what ought to be basically principles, uh, directive principles of policy, turning them into rights. Now, also politically, it seems to me that a lot of this responsibility lies on the government. Because when you say right to food or food security, who the bloody hell can be against it? So all the politicians will actually line up, say that, yeah, we support it. I mean, I can, can you know, I was on one of these NDTV shows, I appeared in this uh, interview, Sonia comes in and says, well, there are five people in the panel, Four of them agree, actually, that they are all for it, so let me start with you, because you disagree. Because so all the other four were politicians, and obviously they had to be uh, a, a, a for it. Finally, I think, you know, if what are we trying to do, accomplish by this uh, food security bill? I mean, ultimately, everybody who is supporting it, pushing it, is saying that, well, people are not eating enough, and we've got to make sure that they eat more. This is not going to work for the reasons I, uh, uh, in a technical language Abhijit said, but you know, it, 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 the people will get five kilograms from the food security, from, from the PDS, free or at a very low price. They will reduce correspondingly five kilograms of purchase from the open market purchases. So it's going to make no difference whatsoever. And actually that is where the Chhattisgarh experience comes to prove it. So I checked actually you know, in 2019 if there had been any expansion in food consumption uh, uh, in Chhattisgarh relative to 2004-05. Not, it is actually marginal decline. There is no rise. Moreover, the consumption levels in Chhattisgarh, uh, whether you look at bottom 30% or you look at the top 30%, is about the same place where the national average is. In fact, it is places like Haryana which have more consumption, uh, which don't have such a, an effective PDS. So I am just mystified, like Surjit is, what in the world are we trying to do with this system? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I've tried to, and, and, and don't tell us, you, know, you say that we don't write it. I've been writing this for three years, and not in one column, but several people say, oh, why do you? Sorry? <laughs> no, that, I, mean, I, actually, I actually asked the editor if he would let me write this Chhattisgarh stuff as a comment in the EPW. The editor said, no, no, we had too many comments and so I can't really take this. He has agreed to take a research article on it, but not as a comment. Or a supportive article. Uh, as, a research, uh, as a research article. Shrekar, can I request you to come up and uh, you must tell me what happened at the end. This looks like a very <laughs> fascinating <laughs> discussion. You have the You want me to? Why don't I shake hands with him? That's a traditional <laughs> way of. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Montek. Thank you for coming.
All right, so I have Montex notes here, which I will not read out. <laughs> um, and let's uh, keep going. And of course, it's going to be difficult now, uh, uh, difficult to step into his shoes. But nonetheless, I will try. I saw Karthik's hands. Karthik is busy talking to Montex. Karthik, do you want to go? I, I, and I don't have a list. So if you need to raise your hands, please do so. So I will now start a list. Yes, Karthik, please. And keep it short, Karthik. You're not known for that, but keep it short. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's not I, well. I'll pass. No, Karthik, come on. <laughs> Can't sulk either. Come on, come on, come on, Karthik. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, just two, I mean, just two points. I mean, one, reiterating what Abhijit said with some example from our work in education, where we basically have experimental evidence of providing school grants to kids and seeing, you know, grants used to buy books and materials. And you see that, you know, basically it has no effect because it's completely offset by household by household spending. Now, this is not to say that in-kind provision will never work, right? Because we have another paper looking at the Bihar Cycle Program, and there you find, in fact, the provision of bicycles for secondary enrollment has a big effect. But why? Because it's basic economics, because the cycle was not inframarginal to what the household was spending. The in-kind provision of the cycle allowed the transfer to stick to the girl as opposed to be part of our intra-household bargaining. And potentially, there were externalities generated by in-kind provision because of safety in numbers of girls going to school. So the point of these examples is not to say that cash is always king, but that you have to do the hard thinking, like I mean case by case, to get the economics right of whether or not what you're doing is inframarginal or not. So the second point, which then relates to that, is Paul Niehaus, my colleague at UCSD. You know, I mean, he's, you know, in the world of charitable giving, right? I mean, he's kind of created a bit of a storm in the past three years by creating a nonprofit that called Give Directly. That just all it does is identifies poor and transfers money to them completely unconditionally, and their operating cost is about four percent for targeting and about three percent for M-Pesa, which is kind of the transaction transfer charging. And when they're trying to do due diligence of a whole range of charities that claim to do everything under the sun, the administrative cost of these charities on average is between 50 and 80 percent, right? I mean, and so now again coming, so give, give, give well which ranks charities, I mean ranks give directly as number two, the only charity that's ranked above is a charity that provides insecticide treated bed nets and that's because there's externalities there, right? So the point of all of this is to say that this is Paul's terminology, so I'm just kind of using it here because I think it's really useful, is to think about Cash transfers is the index fund of social policy, right? I mean, so essentially, we know that it's possible for good fund managers to potentially beat the index, but the burden of proof is on the guys who say they have alpha to kind of convince you that they can do better than the index fund, right? So using the same language, I think it's not the case that cash is always king. I mean, if you're providing public goods, but then that gets to a much larger political discussion which Jeff alluded to, which is why at this stage of development are we not spending on public goods, right? relative to redistribution, I mean, but that's, a, I'm not even getting there. But even conditional on what you spend in redistribution, I think the index fund analogy is really, really useful because if charities are spending 30, 50 to 70 percent in administrative costs, in government, like, I mean, there's the administrative costs plus the leakage. So once you add those numbers up, I think it's just, you know, it's stunning. So the only point I will grant, I mean, on the other side, having spent the last two years trying to implement cash transfers in Bihar, is the point I will absolutely unambiguously grant Jean Drez, is that we haven't demonstrated the capacity that we can, in fact, deliver the cash, right? I mean, so what we don't have is the BC network, what we don't have is the access, and in fact, um, you know, this is where our project has struggled. So I think let's absolutely we're not where we need to be in terms of implementing this as policy, but as the other based infrastructure is rolled out, I think this is exactly uh, the backdrop in which we need more of these studies and more research and force the conversation that the burden of proof is not on the cash, but that the burden of proof is on those who claim that there's externalities beyond the cash, and that's what the index fund analogy does. Mm -hmm. um. Let's see. Uh, I have several hands. So Sonal, then Rohini, then Dilip. Uh, uh, Swami? Yes, then Swami. Point. I think it's very well taken that we might want to focus on outcome versus processes. And most of our legislation seem to focus on process rather than on the outcome. So for example, for right to education, uh, the whole idea is that you should place children into age-appropriate classrooms, okay? which is sort of more sort of the social dimension of schooling. However, almost all the research on education done by people like Land Pritchett and Rukmini Banerjee shows that it's actually the skill appropriate placement that makes a difference rather than the age appropriate placement. 
Same way, if you are thinking in terms of nutrition versus uh, uh, food security, um, there is quite a bit of research coming out of National Institute on Nutrition, which says that the basic problem for India is not really the caloric intake as much as micronutrient intake, uh, fruits, vegetables, dairy, etc. Now, uh, providing more cereal might not quite take care of the problem. Uh, on the cereal, about the only thing that the most nutritionists seem to be recommending is uh, increased availability of things like bajra and uh, jawar, etc. And on that, actually, the problem is supply rather than um, in production, rather than sort of pricing. Okay? So I think the problem is at some level to just think through what is the outcome and what is the instrument we need to achieve that outcome and then focus on the instrument rather than ideology and the processes. I can't read policy roundtable. Abhijit was making the same points about nutrition and micronutrients and connecting the outcomes to the uh, instruments and the measures that, that are designed to achieve those outcomes. And of course, we've gone exactly the wrong way. Rohini. Shekhar. Uh, so the, this cash versus kind debate has been bothering me to the extent that I've never really wanted to enter it. I don't, I didn't really think there was a useful way in which I could convey what was bothering me about it, but this discussion has actually been interesting and so I want to say a couple of things. Um, there are two things that keep coming up that bother me. One is the this paternalistic argument that Subhashish made, that are we being paternalistic when we say that the poor can't decide what to, what best to spend it on? And the other thing is this opposition of cash versus kind for a particular program, uh, which really sweeps aside all the global optimization issues. And uh, it's been particularly bothersome because I think it does have an effect on policy. I think there are policies, states that have moved, initiatives that have moved towards cash transfers for particular schemes, uh, using the logic that let's fix this, let's do the most efficient, let's find the most efficient way of doing this transfer. And I don't know whether they've got it right or wrong, but in a sense, it's that, that whole approach that I find bothersome. So on the, on the paternalistic front, I, think, I don't think it's paternalistic to say that they're always bargaining problems. If people are rich, it doesn't have as serious an effect on nutrition as it might have if people are poor. So if you're interested in nutrition, then maybe you want to take these Seriously, I don't think you're saying the poor are different from the rich. I think you're just recognizing that these things might be important if your final goal is nutrition. And so to some extent, it's related to what your, what your goal is. Um, I thought that Avijit's point about the price versus the income effect was very interesting. And so, uh, but on the other hand, I think that it isn't always an income effect. So I think when Siddharamaya just recently in Bangalore is announcing rice now, you know, everyone's competing with each other. So it's this race to the bottom. And so he's now announced rice for one rupee a kg. Uh, there's someone who just bought that rice said it's really terrible rice. So I don't even know if it's an income transfer there. Um, but clearly, I don't think it's going to do anything to nutrition. On the other hand, Farzana now has done a lot of work on midday meals. We've looked at them in Delhi and, and she's looked at them elsewhere. And it's a tiny, tiny transfer. It would mean nothing as an income transfer, but I actually think it has had an effect on child nutrition. It's had an effect on child attendance at the margin. So not overall, but if you think about families who are really trying to decide, should we keep a girl in fifth grade? Should we send a child in first grade? I think those effects we found at least are big. We've also found, and this is partly what bothers me with the experimental approach that's got popular, is that the midday meal scheme in Delhi worked terribly 10 years ago, it's got much, much better. So the quality of the food people are getting is much better. So I think that you know, the cash versus kind debate is, it's not always an income transfer, but it often is, and I think putting that on the table is important. This, this, the second part of this is that you can't always buy goods. They're just not available. So one of the very interesting things about this cycle program in Bihar, which Karthik has worked on, which Maitresh has worked on, is people were really given a choice in many cases whether they wanted to go and buy the bicycle or they were asked would you rather buy the bicycle or would you rather it be given to you. They were actually given cash and lots of people bought the bicycle but also the people in remote villages wanted the bicycle given to them because it was just a hassle to actually go and get it. So there are lots of 
aspects of this whole debate, and it's not necessarily paternalism. It's just that certain goods are not out there. If you're living in Delhi, you can't be living in a slum, have your income go up, and buy affordable housing outside the slum. It's not an option. Black families in the United States can't go to a good public school because the incomes go up, and I think that determines expenditure patterns. I cannot, if my income doubled, I cannot buy a little bit more of clean air in Delhi. I would certainly be will willing to pay for it. And so I think it's not just uh, mixing these things up with, I mean, we have to recognize missing markets, and you know, it's not a paternalistic argument. So I, I have lots more, but I think I should save that for, for another time. Um, Dilip, and I think what we will do is we will take a few more questions. I have several people on the list, and then I'll turn back to the panelists, and then we'll wrap it up there. Dilip. <coughs> so it seems to me that <coughs> the whole issue of food versus cash is kind of posing it very narrowly, and let, let me just grant the argument that it doesn't matter because, you know, as Abhijit argued, you know, they're the fundamentally the same. Um, uh, and you know there could be sort of leakage uh, arguments on the one hand, and you know. I want to go into a, a somewhat different discussion, and that discussion is about you know short term uh, you know helping someone sh in the short term as against encouraging them to develop capabilities that's going to improve their condition in the long run. So if you if you uh, you know. You, in my family, there have been people that we've tried to help, and you know, quite often the question is, how do you want to help them? Do you want to give them money that will enable them to eat today, or do you want to teach them a skill? And I think it's, it's essentially that, that concern. Now, this relates, I think, fundamentally to the concern about paternalism. So if you give it, if you, if you impart a skill to them, rather than give them money that enables them to eat today, okay, that seems paternalistic. But that argument of paternalism, the way an economist would phrase it, is essentially an argument that for the same amount of expenditure, if you take a, 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 a welfareist social welfare function which is consistent with the Pareto principle, then it would be Pareto improving to give it in the form of cash and let that person decide how to spend a certain amount of money. But that argument is couched in a short-run framework where people's capabilities are given. Take it into a dynamic framework where people invest in the education and health of their children. We know that the poor can, cannot spend at the same level as the rich, okay? And that the poor underinvest because of missing markets and so forth. They can't borrow to, f to finance their children's education and so forth. So in that framework, uh, you can show that any system of cash-based transfers uh, is Pareto-dominated in you know, a dynamic setting where you incorporate effects on investment by a system of conditional transfers. Now, Montague referred at the beginning to about conditional cash transfers being a Latin thing and somehow not appropriate to India. This argument is perfectly general, universal. It, it applies irrespective of the level of development and so on. So I don't understand why we are not trying to focus our attention, apart from the public good argument, which I think is really fundamental that, that Jeff raised, uh, why we are not focusing on public health and sanitation, why we are not focusing on a more dynamic view of the building of capabilities. In some sense, I think even in terms of inequality, what really matters is inequality of opportunity. What we want is a mobile society. We don't necessarily want equality of outcomes. And in that context, this is fundamental. And finally, from a fiscal sustainability standard, you know, a welfare system which is built, uh, built around, let's say, protection of the young, okay, Pregnant women and children up to the age of three, ensuring you know, that you limit your program to that and public health and sanitation is going to be substantially lower than the cost of uh, you know, the, the proposed alternatives that we are debating here. Thank you, Dilip. Your remarks actually echo what Raghuram Rajan said yesterday about some of the things that make democracy and free enterprise work. Um, let's see, I had Swami, and then I have a few hands in the back. Just to bring a political economy thing into it, I mean, this is, I mean, to me, it's the, the, the issue has been debated as though what's going to happen is going to be decided by economists. Uh, whereas, unfortunate thing is the other way around. Now, as Arvin says, if the, you the, say these forums are the only places where economists have their say. <laughs> Indeed. You know, 
the first thing is, as Arvind says, the distinction between rights and entitlements. I mean, the right, I mean, if you look at uh, Robinson, Asimoglu, everything, all the rights they talk about, glorious revolution, blah, blah, all of those are, as Arvind says, are what would be called the negative freedoms. And the Supreme Court can enforce them. Entitlements require budgets. The people who are promoting the rights-based program, in many ways, it seems to me, are people who want to promote a larger state. It is being done by saying, let's do a right way. So, so a number of the activists are those who want a larger state by other means. The political class will accommodate them because as Mr. Bush said, he wants no child left behind. Here our politicians say, no right left behind. You suggest a right to good governance, somebody said clean air. You suggest a right to clean air, they will pass a legislation for a right to clean air. There will be universal uh, agreement on it. As for the implementation, they will say it will be like all the other rights. Uh, implementation is not a particularly an issue. I mean, Narega, what, what Sujit uh, raised, now Narega was in fact different from the other programs insofar as if the state could not provide the job, it was supposed to provide cash and nobody provided the cash. So we have a political system which is very willing to take on rights and very clear that it will not implement them. You know, uh, it, it should surprise nobody and you know, the track record is so very, very clear that this needs to be taken into account when we are having this kind of academic decision. Uh, what then is the real fear, I said, uh, one thing is the, is, is the waste of money. It is said that this uh, food security bill, for instance, uh, if you are increasing the coverage from 45% to 67% of the population, in any case, obviously, you are not targeting the poor, because the poor are already supposed to be covered in that 45%. So if at all it's a middle class, and even then there will be leakage, blah, 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 blah. Uh, Amartya Sen came out, I think, with this figure out of a hat in this debate with Arvind Panagadia, or it may save 1,000 lives per week or 50,000 lives per year to which Raghuram Rajan had the classic reply, spending 50,000 crores on saving 50,000 lives, is it really necessary to spend one crore for saving each life? Are there not cheaper ways? So, you know, at the theoretical level, you can raise all the arguments. The politician is going to accept every single right that you put forward. My real fear is having accepted that every single right, when we get to this cash transfer versus food, the real problem, the real danger, if you ask me, is that he will ultimately go both for the cash transfer and for the food. I mean, the discussion right now is as though the politician is going to be persuaded to choose one or the other. The real fiscal problem, the crowding out problem, and as Devesh Kapoor has excellently said, I mean, when you put more and more rights, this particular thing is creating such a burden that you are eroding the capacity of the state itself, leading to the misgovernance which means that, in fact, no right at all will be delivered. So my real fear is that, you know, we are going to end up by getting both cash transfers and physical delivery of food on the ground that this is politically inescapable, leading to a fiscal crisis. I would like the opinion of the honorable members on this. Okay, I'm going to take perhaps just one last question. There are several there. One last question in the back, and then maybe I'll take the questions. One is that, in 80, I looked at the 87, 8, 50 percent of the people got all their f cereals from PDS, and even those who got all their cereals from PDS, uh, the value of the income transfer was less than three rupees per person per month in most states. And I don't think subsequent analysis have shown any fundamental improvement in the efficiency of the PDS. So this is one thing that what is going to be the true cost of delivering this PDS is, a, is an important issue. Uh, Montek says, yes, no, it's not fiscal deficit. That's an important issue. But I'm concerned about something else. I feel that the, the promising one rupee a kilogram coarse grains and other things, all those farmers who are going food grain for their own consumption would have very little incentive to grow their food. They would much rather buy it from the PDS shops. And uh, then the answer that is given by the proponents of the right to food says, no, no, but we will have a public uh, procurement system which will buy food from them at 15 rupees a kilogram for, uh, buy and sell it at one rupee a kilogram back to them. Uh, I think 
to believe that the Food Corporation of India would be able to procure food grains from every nook and corner of the country and every farmer is a huge uh, leap of faith. I don't think it will happen. And if that doesn't happen, you will have a huge disruption in your entire food production system. Okay. Uh, there was a gentleman at the back. Yes, please, you. Uh, just a uh, question to the panelists. Is the food right, uh, the, the Right to Food Act an attempt to put food on the table of the poor people while increasingly denying them the fundamental right of justice, security, and life? Okay. Actually, it will echo some of this uh, already on the, on the table. And I would like to uh, just remind uh, all of you of the Malala Day that happened on the 16th of July, where she said that right to education, and education is the major thing that would take us forward. So if we're spending money in, on these kind of issues, and the track record, as already Swami pointed out, is as bad. Uh, after 66 years, look at the schools and the, uh, and the government schools uh, which are giving services to the poor. And, and talking about midday meals, yesterday's news said how many, people, how many children died, I think, in Bihar. Uh, so if these are the issues, so what I'm trying to say is, we have to take on account the track record. We have to give the basic things we, we have failed in, and then think of spending more. That's my take on this. OK. Um, I'm going to, I have several names and several hands, but I'm going to turn to Pranab, and then to Shubhashish, and finally to Abhijit. Pranab. Yeah, I don't have much to add to what has been said, uh, except for two or three points. First. Uh, I cannot but react to Surjit's passionate quoting of Bob Dylan uh, for how many roads and how many experiments for cash. Unfortunately, they have all the experiments are, you are referring to are, are food uh, distribution, not cash. There are very few experiments that have been carried out with cash. Now, you are talking about the Latin American. They are not comparable because Latin America is a much more of an urbanized 80% uh, 85% percent urbanized uh, context uh, in which the formal sector is much larger. Uh, so we need to find out. Uh, I think, yes, in spite of all your passion, I would say I need, we need more cash experiments uh, in India uh, to find out what happens, particularly in a situation only 40% of the households have any bank accounts. So how are you going to deliver the cash if they don't have, 60% of the people don't have bank accounts and other when will, will it reach the sufficiently large number of people? So we have to wait for a long time. And meanwhile, we have to do something. And so we, in, order to do, in order to find out what to do, we need more experiments to give us results. Yes, uh, you are impatient, but I, 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 I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in favor of more ex experiments on the cash issue. A conceptual issue that Arvind uh, Panagaria raised, I want to react to that about these two kinds of liberty. This is the original Isaiah Berlin distinction between positive liberty and negative liberty. And, and if I have not misunderstood um, uh, Arvind, uh, he's saying is that for negative things like violation of uh, ne negative liberties, uh, that the Supreme Court can tell you uh, to do. But positive liberty, how will, are you going to enforce it? now? I disagree, completely disagree. So we all have the right to life. So a murderer comes, or if a, if a violence occurs against a woman, and the woman goes to the police, is that an, is not an enforcement problem in India about uh, against sexual violence and all other kinds of violence, as insecurity of property in India? What do the poor, the, when the poor face the police, isn't there an enforcement problem there? So I think, and there are enforcement problems all around, whether it's positive liberty, whether it's negative liberty, one cannot distinguish, uh, one cannot just dismiss the case for positive liberty uh, just on the basis that they are not uh, uh, rightly, they are not well enforced. In any case, Justice Pragerty and Krishnaya, by linking almost every right and thing, they are not to right to life. They made everything enforceable as a fundamental right. This judicial activism of an extreme right. kind. Well, I, as you know, I argued against too much judicial activism. And I said, if you really believe in right to life, the first right one should think about is clean drinking water. 
Um, the only other issue that I wanted to raise was, again, uh, was uh, getting a clarification from TN. So did I understand you correctly that you are in completely in favor of um, uh, the, the cash, uh, 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 except in famine type of con concatenation of circumstances? Uh, so th if that is my, if you, my understanding is correct, I'd like to know what are you going, uh, do you have any suggestions for preschool children, which is the, really where the, the most vulnerable uh, group in society, and even uh, people, economists like Heckman, who do not believe in the welfare system otherwise, he thinks preschool children, we have to do, uh, the state has to be intervention. Sorry? Preschool children. The issue Did you mention something? I, I just maybe in missed In part, it. the intra-household allocation decision. If the parents do not, uh, even if you give them 20 kilograms of rice or whatever, exactly. if they don't no, then, feed, then, then, yeah, then I, that's the issue. Then, uh, then let me say, yeah. you can extend this issue. There are many cases in which people do not uh, take uh, measures in health uh, because they don't have the information, they don't have the awareness uh, in health and education. The consumer is all not always the best judge, and so on. In such cases, uh, uh, you might involve uh, more involvement. Cash transfer is, may not be enough. Let me stop here and turn to the other panel. Subhashish. Thank you, indeed. Um, very quickly, in fact, in the, in the paper that we have written, that we have referred to all the studies, including some earlier ones which supported cash transfer and uh, others which have now come out for the same experiments that they are not working. There is indeed a lot of uh, disagreement on whether cash, in the literature on whether cash transfers work or not, and therefore experiments are needed. And one specific example I want to give is that, I don't know if anybody knows this, that from July 1st this year, you know, because we, we made the cash transfer through bank accounts, right? So it was tough opening bank accounts. That's why I mentioned the Madhya Pradesh villages where we went and did the UID so that we could get the KYC to do the bank account, right? I don't know if we know that from July 1st, the UID no longer operates as K, uh, KYC for opening bank accounts. So we have to be very careful when we talk about these policies that we are trying to do, how it has worked, where the context is very, very important. Right? We have been pushing for the cash transfer scheme simply because we felt that with the UID, it is easy to open bank accounts, right? Because one of the big issues is reaching the money to the people. And then, you know, Nandan Nilakan, he talked to, who is your chairman, right? He talked, to, or he's a member of, right? he talked about creating these last mile accounts, which are very useful, and therefore we thought we could do the cash transfer. It's worth doing the experimentation, right? But from July 1st, the UID is no longer part of the KYC, and therefore, this entire you know, model that we are trying to build collapses. So we have to, I'm sorry to say, we have to know the context in which we are working. And many of the you know, results from outside that we are trying to scale up are just not you know, implementable the way it has been implemented there. We need to know how to do it here. The second point I want to make since it uh, did work out, uh, so since it did, did come out a lot, is this you know, debate between rights and policy. I'm not going to go into that debate, but I'm going to mention, you know, um, mention something. If we look at Europe, right, where there, there is nothing of, it's probably the, if we talk about social safety net, if we talk about welfare systems, right, Europe clearly comes out on top, at least many countries in Europe come out on top. And the interesting thing is that if we look at the history, there are some things that did not happen which we talk about all the time. First, some of the countries which have the best you know, welfare systems were the poorest when they brought it in, the social safety system. Right? They never talked about whether they have enough fiscal uh, you know, flexibility or leeway to be able to implement it. The second important thing that we need to talk about is that when, when these uh, things were implemented, right, they were implemented with policy, not with rights. There was actual policy which allowed, you know, which went in and implemented these things. Right? So there is something to think about on that because our debate is focused on, is focused on um, fiscal and uh, whether uh, we can do it through rights, whether we have the system to do it, all these sorts of things, right? But there are countries which historically were in similar situations, right? Which have achieved what we are trying to achieve 
in our social welfare system. Unfortunately, we are not looking at those experimentations at all. And that, I think, is a real waste. Abhijit? <clears throat> Two comments. One to Dilip. I think the reason why, I think you're totally right, of course, but except for the one, I think, key issue, which is that some re I don't know exactly why Mexico is able to get credible measurement of, um, for example, um, you know, whether people were vaccinated or not, or whether children went to school. But I think this is a huge issue here. I mean, you know, if you look at government school, uh, because money allocation in a lot of states in government schools depends on the f on class one attendance. Class one attendance is completely uncorrelated with f future class attendance, and uh, uh, not completely uncorrelated, very weakly correlated with it. And I think there is a huge issue of n these numbers being made up. So until we have a system where the conditionalities can be effectively measured, it's very hard to imagine doing conditional cash transfers, despite, I think, everything you said. Uh, I, think, I think that's, that's the core. I think that's that's what's stopping us right now, uh, um, and uh, to Swami, I mean, I think I, I actually wrote an op-ed where I, I, sort of I, can raise the issue you raised, which is that I think that we we don't we don't entirely know what we are hoping for because I think that one thing that's going to happen once the cash transfer system is really in place is that and then it's, you have a very efficient spigot to open whenever you want. And there's a lot of people who will have incentives to open that spigot. So one of the things I had brought up in that article was now that the spigot isn't still available, it might be a good time for a constitutional amendment which restricts all subsidies to X percent of GDP. All parties should agree to that. that I think that has, nobody will, will but perhaps, but I think that's what we should demand. We should demand that there should be a constitutional amendment to restrict all subsidies to X percent of GDP, where X, I'm, I'm even for a high number there. But, but once we've done that, I think then the rubber will hit the road, because I think then people will start thinking, okay, if I just cut a little bit the petroleum subsidy, I can give away a lot of money to these people who are going to vote for me. I think all kinds of interesting things would happen if we managed to put in something like that. So it's just something to keep in mind, maybe. Well, this has been quite a discussion. Um, I sometimes feel, though, in discussions like these that we preach to the converted. And in some ways, this is the biggest challenge that Swami and others, of course, uh, are very cognizant of. Um, nonetheless, it's important that we have these discussions. I'm really grateful to the three panelists and to Montek for coming. Um, this is then the end of the India Policy Forum 2013. Let me thank all the paper writers, discussants, chairs, uh, who have been so actively engaged, and of course all of you who have come to this IPF for a day and a half and really thrown yourself at the discussions and the debates. I also want to recognize Brookings, our partner, NCAR's partner in this for 10 years now, for the steady support that we've had. Barry Bosworth is not here. We are sorry he's not. He's missed a great IPF. But he will be editing the volume along with Arvind and myself, so he will remain engaged uh, on this. Um, I also need to recognize the team that's put this together. They should have been in this room, but they obviously are not there. So I'm going to call out Kitu Makija and um, uh, Sudesh Bala. Uh, we have a young man, Aryaman Jalota, who's been very helpful in this process, and a whole team of other people, including Mr. Joshi, who many of you who've come from outside depend on for all your logistics. Let's just give them a very warm round of applause. <laughs> ah, there they are. So we really need to thank this entire team for the work that goes into putting the IPF together. And we're really very grateful to them. They've worked long, worked long hours, worked sometimes late into the night and on weekends. And that's shown in the way, smooth way in which the IPF has happened. Again, 
Let me thank everybody. There's lunch outside. Uh, the IPF panelists uh, are requested to bring their food in. We're going to have the traditional uh, post-IPF uh, lunch together. Uh, all other invited guests are please welcome to join in the lunch outside. Thank you all, and really it's been a wonderful time having you here. Bye-bye.